Good morning. Welcome to New Baptist Church. It is good to be together this morning. We're glad that you are with us. If you are new here, up on the screen, there's a QR code. There was our technology is not working so well for us. Anyways, we're glad you're here. I um, hope that uh, you will, uh, will come back and join us. Here at New Baptist Church, we want to know Christ, grow in his word, and be a blessing wherever he places us. And if you're looking to get connected, we want to encourage you throughout the summer um, and, and throughout the year. We have Sunday school classes every Sunday morning. Uh, Then on Wednesday nights, we have youth programming, children's programming, and adult Bible study. Um, And so invite you to come back and be a part of those things. A couple of things that we want to to give you a heads up here um, just in the upcoming weeks. First off, um, we will have a senior adult lunch on June the 8th. And so this week is the deadline to RSVP. So let Pat know in the office uh, that you are interested. I think there's a sign-up sheet out there in the welcome area. So sign up for the senior adult lunch. It is on June the 8th. Also, speaking of senior adult lunches, um, Roy Maynard is one of uh, our beloved members who has uh, made senior adult events happen uh, for, for years. And uh, he has been fantastic to, to, to just faithfully lead those. And um, I've, heard, I've heard all kinds of stories about Roy's minute-to-minute uh, planning details of trips and all. But Roy is planning another trip. He is um, actually moving to Florida. And so to say bon voyage and see you later to Roy, um, we are having a lunch today. Or it's not lunch. It's just a, a get-together at 1.30. Um, you're welcome to come and just uh, to, to, to share some time with Roy and, and to be able to, to enjoy him this afternoon. Um, so that is back here in the wild side at 1.30 this afternoon um, for Roy's going away party. Um, also, um, the youth, uh, you might have the smell of chocolate chip cookies in the air. Um, the youth have been working all morning on uh, baking chocolate chip cookies in the back. And out in the, the welcome areas, they will be uh, selling those chocolate chip cookies for a donation. Um, this all goes to support our mission trip. Uh, we leave on June the 11th to go to Philadelphia. And so help us um, support our students as they go to Philadelphia to work and to serve um, by, by buying some cookies. You might not need those cookies today, but maybe your neighbor does. And so grab some cookies, give them away along the way, and um, drop a donation for, for the youth. We are glad that you're here with us this morning. It's a good morning to worship together. Let's begin uh, by reciting scripture. If you would stand with me. We are memorizing Psalm 1. This morning we will recite Psalm 1 verses 1 through 5. Let's say it all together. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous." Join me as we pray. God, thanks for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, to be able to um, worship you, God, to hear your word proclaimed. And God, we thank you for the many ministries that we have to gather together, to connect with one another, and to be able to be a blessing um, here and around the world. And God, I I do pray um, that you will be with us this morning as we we celebrate in song, as we recognize um, graduates, as we um, uh, celebrate the ministries of our church, as we hear your word proclaimed and taught to us. May we be challenged. And and may we go and grow together to be a blessing wherever you place us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. If you will remain standing as we begin to worship together.
trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can all come here to worship you. Um, and I just thank you for this day at Pentecost, um, just remembering when you poured your spirit out on us. And we pray that you will pour your spirit out on us this morning again, that we can sing your praises, um, and that you will just move within us. Pray for Trent as he comes to give the message, that we can have eyes and ears to listen and hearts to be open to what you have to say to us. And so in your name we pray. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. I have the privilege this morning of talking about a number of transitions. I, in youth ministry, it seems like we are regularly um, working with transitions, whether it's new students moving in or graduates moving on to the next stage of their life. And this morning, I, I just want to take this opportunity just to recognize a few transitions um, in the lives of, of our students and in the lives of our church. Uh, first off, I want to recognize our 2023 graduates. And so um, this is a time where we celebrate those who have graduated from high school or or college or graduate degrees um, and just celebrate them and, and look towards their next steps. Uh, so if, uh, if I call your name, um, up on the screen is a picture and so you can see where they graduated from. Uh, Nina's going to come up here and she'll stand here in the front and we've got a gift, uh, and Carolyn too, um, and so we've got a gift for you and so once I call your name, go ahead and come on forward um, and you're welcome to applaud after I call each of these folks' names. Um, starting with our high school graduates, Evan Willis. Yeah. 
Next we have Landon Campbell. And then our college grads, we have Bailey Arkell. And Chad Booth. Harper Haney. Caroline Kinder. And Drew Riley. And Ripley Riley. And Kinsey Sexton. Jake Sharp. And Mary Grace Workman. Let's give it up for all of our graduates. If you would, check out this video that we want to show about our youth ministry as we kick off the summer. So throughout the summer, every Wednesday evening, start at 6 o'clock, we will have uh, what we're going to call the Summer Squad Wars for 6th through 12th graders. Um, and th that is coming out of 6th through 12th grade. Um, so we uh, invite you on Wednesday night, if you're in that age range, come be a part. Uh, we've got lots of great programming, Camp Cowan, and all kinds of different things that will happen throughout the summer. One of the big things, if you notice on the screen, are our state youth events. These are a major component of our, or of our year long um, youth ministry calendar. Uh, things like junior high and senior high convention, fall rally, the summer kickoff. These are all opportunities where our youth group gets to interact with other youth groups around the state um, as a part of the West Virginia Baptist Convention, so that our students get to learn and to grow with other youth groups around the state. All of these events are planned and led by students and an incredible team of adults that help them. This ministry is called the Youth Ministry Planning Team, or as many of us call it, YMPT. One of the adult leaders of YMPT is Bethany Cox, who is here with us this morning. And to the best of my knowledge, New Baptist Church has had 13 students uh, participate in YMPT under the leadership of... Bethany in the last 14 years. Um, in addition, um, I got to serve as a student with Bethany on YMPT. I won't say how many years ago. 
under the leadership of Rob Ely. And so a couple of weeks ago, Bethany served at her last state youth event um, in this role. And so we thought it was right for us to recognize Bethany to say thank you this morning. And so I asked some of these leaders as I reached out to uh, those former 13 students, I got lots of messages back and I'm not going to share all the words that they said because they were incredible and lots of great stuff. But I asked them to share some of their thoughts on Bethany. And here are just some of the words that, that came up. She's welcoming. She's calm. She's a servant. She's humble. She goes above and beyond. She's faithful. She knows how to get things done. She's light and cheerful. Um, she has served behind the scenes. She's set out food. She's picked up trash. She's given students ride. And one of the things that one of the students highlighted was how much they loved when she would uh, swing past Spring Hill uh, Bakery to grab some hot dogs for him while she could. She uh, has served under two West Virginia Baptist Convention staff people, and I asked them to share some thoughts. So Rob Ely is with us this morning. I'm going to invite Rob and Bethany up on stage, but I'm going to ask you guys to cue the video. This is from Na Jill Narraway, um, who's the, uh, the, the Associate Director of Camping and Youth and uh, the current person in charge of YMPT right now. So she's got some remarks for Bethany, and so you guys come on up. Bethany. Thank you for your 14 years of service to YMPT, for your faithful partnership in ministry, and what's more, thank you for your friendship. We recognize your service, your heart for the Lord, and your ministry to see others succeed. On behalf of all of the student and adult leaders from YMPT, the youth groups from across the WVBC, and for me personally, I say thank you for your faithful partnership in ministry for the 14 years of your service on the YMPT leadership. <laughs> yeah, use that mic. I, I do want to say, I'm not sure who sent the word calm in to represent her, but we might want to question that. You know, I have in my notes, I just wrote down Bethany Cox, or Bethany Crouch Cox, because that's the way that we knew her in the beginning. And Bethany is one of those people that have embraced the legacy. When you have that Crouch name attached to you, um, there's a lot that goes with that. But she has embraced that legacy as a wonderful young lady um, because I've had the privilege of being there, um, YLC, YMPT, and Cowan staff. So that makes me real old, right? Um, but it's been beautiful to watch um, Bethany grow. Um, and, and as I was reading Psalm 145, this just kind of expressed some things I wanted to say about her. You think about Bethany. This is the words of the psalmist. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. And you've just been able to commend the works of the Lord through the joy of your life um, and laughter and I think you and Beth got in trouble a time or two with laughing, Maybe. right? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. All right. And, and just again, the YLC, the YMPT, and Cowan staff, and now as our mission board chair and all the mission work you do here, you've been able to just demonstrate and commend the works of the Lord and pass those on um, to future generations. And that mighty work that you've gotten to do is invest not only in the 13 from this church, but many across our state of West Virginia. So it's been a joy and fun to laugh with you and cry with you, right? There's um, been both. <laughs> there's been both. Uh, I think I made you cry. No, yeah. won't, we won't talk about that. Um, God has been good, and it's been fun to watch you grow and serve him. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you all. So on behalf of New Baptist Church and the West Virginia Baptist Convention, I want to say thank you, and we want to say thank you to Jesus for you and for your service and your work. And uh, also, it's not just a certificate. We as a church want to give uh, uh, for something that's near your heart. Um, so we are giving a scholarship in your honor to Camp Cowan. 
And so uh, that there are scholarship opportunities available. If you can't afford to go to camp, um, we want you to go to Camp Cowan. And so there's a scholarship out there in honor of Bethany for you, if that is you that you've never been there. Um, so we just want to say thank you to Jesus and thank you to Bethany. So let's give her a round of applause. You're welcome. Thank you. And we could not be more proud. But today is the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. And it is not lost on us as a church. It is more than the first, the start of the summer season. Memorial Day was first called Decoration Day. And first nationally observed in 1868. From 1868 until 1970, it was observed on May the 30th. In 1971, the Congress set the date as the last Monday in May to be officially recognized as Memorial Day, and so that's how it is celebrated now. In honor of those and in remembrance, would you join me in prayer? Our Father, today we remember, we thank you for the freedom that we have in our relationship with you. We thank you for the many freedoms that we enjoy living in this country. Oh God, we give you thanks for the sacrifice of those who in the words of Abraham Lincoln gave the last full measure of devotion in defense of the freedoms we share. We also remember, though, that with freedom comes responsibility to care for those around us. In the words of Jesus, we are to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick and the imprisoned, to be your hands and feet in this place. Oh God, may we never forget the responsibility that comes with the freedom that we have. That we are always free to do what is right, what is good, what is righteous, what is just. But we are never free just to do as we please. Well, God, on this day, we remember. On this day, we give thanks for the freedom of worship. We give thanks for the freedom to speak, to speak freely, to move freely around, to share what we know of you. We thank you for the freedoms we have in Christ. In these moments, we pause to remember and to honor those who died in defense of the political freedoms we share in this country. We also pause and remember and give thanks for the one who died that we might really be free. Oh God, help us never to forget that freedom is never free. Cost the life of your son for us to be free. The life of many that we might be free here. Oh, God, thank you. We remember. We honor and we give thanks. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Um, I have, well, I've chosen the Navy hymn. We're a Navy family, but I thank all of you that have served and all of you that have sacrificed. The reason I've chosen the Navy hymn is my dad was in the Naval Reserves. I had two uncles that um, served in the Navy. One made a full-time career out of it. Um, my father-in-law went all the way to be commanding officer um, of a Naval base and made a full career out of it. And I have a cousin that served in the Gulf War. So, and they were all Navy. 
So I'm starting with the Navy hymn, and Jay has the words up on the screen so you know what the words are. Sherry and Lisa. I'd like our children to please stand up. It's time to dismiss them to Kids Church. Let's please give them a round of applause as they go out. There's a lot happening today. Graduation and Memorial Day and the day of Pentecost and celebrating Bethany and later we'll celebrate Roy. So there's just a lot going on. And so let's uh, bow our heads um, to give thanks to our Lord. Gracious Father, we do thank you for today. And, and Lord, as we um, saw those pictures of those graduates, I am just m reminded of what amazing people are in this church. And I'm grateful for these young lives 
And I do pray that as they graduate from and as they graduate towards, that you protect them, that you guide them, that you draw them to yourself. I lift them up to you and um, ask your hand upon their future plans and upon their direction, Lord. I pray for their families. I pray for um, what you're doing in them today. And Father, as we gather here today, I do continue to echo Courtney's prayer that on this day of Pentecost, we are mindful of how you are faithful to your promises and your promise to give to us your spirit, which you have. May we um, listen. May we enjoy. May we draw near. May we catch a glimpse of you, Father, through your spirit in your word. I thank you for this time. I ask that your spirit here abides with us now as we open up your word and May we um, catch a glimpse of you, but also a glimpse of ourselves and our need of you. I thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we are in the study of 2 Samuel. We are at chapter 5 of 2 Samuel. And the book of 2 Samuel covers a 40-year period of time of David as king. That's what 2 Samuel is all about. And I have called this study of David as king as the courage to be different. And the reason I've called it this is because I feel like that we are living in a day, um, possibly more than any other time in history, where the pressures of the world, and I'm talking about social media and internet and what we watch on TV and all of that stuff, where the pressures of the world are pressing down upon us to conform to the patterns of this world like no other time. And I, I say that because Scripture calls us to not be conformed to this world, but be to be transformed by the renewing of our mind to be like Christ, to have the mind of Christ. And David is a person who lived in a world who I know pressed upon him to be a certain way. But he wasn't. He was different. He was a man who sought after the Lord with all of his heart. He was a different person. And because he was different, not only was there a kingdom established, the house of David, but that house of David thus becomes a foreshadowing of a future kingdom, of a greater kingdom, of a greater king. This is a part of why our passage this morning is so important. In our scripture today, 2 Samuel chapter 5, some really important things happen that continue to have historical ramifications to us today. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, we will read in just a moment that David becomes king over all of Israel, not just Judah. In this chapter, we will see God fulfilling his prophetic promise in David's victory over Jerusalem and his victory over the Philistines. And in this chapter, we will catch a glimpse of that future kingdom yet to come. Just a glimpse. So what I want to do right now is ask you in your Bible to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. I'm not going to put the scripture up on the screen. As I read through 2 Samuel chapter 5, I'm going to pause and unpack briefly just some of the things that we read. And then I want to return to one theme of 2 Samuel 5 to go deeper into it there. And I'm going to break down 2 Samuel chapter 5 into themes, things that are being talked about in this chapter as we read through it. So theme number one is David being made king, verses 1 through 5. I'm reading now. Then all of the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. Please note the language. This is from Genesis chapter 2 when Adam sees Eve. And, and thus they're using a language of making a covenant. And that's exactly what they're doing here. Reading on, in times past when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. You, you have been our Savior. And the Lord said to you, you shall be a shepherd of my people of Israel, and you shall be a prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant. There's the covenant with them at Hebron. 
before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. This makes David now 37 years when he is crowned as king over Israel. Theme two, Jerusalem is captured. Notice the very first thing that David does, verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind, the lame will ward you off, thinking David can't come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David, and David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Now, this taking of Jerusalem is a big deal. And, and, and I'm going to be talking about, in just a moment, about these comments about the blind and the lame. So if you're thinking, that's really mean, why, did, why does the Bible say that? Give yourself some mental space. I'm coming back to that, so hang on to that. But I want to highlight right here that this capture of Jerusalem is a fulfillment of a prophetic promise. Way back in Genesis chapter 12, the Lord makes a covenant with Abraham and promises to Abraham, he says, this is verse 7 of Genesis 12, to your offspring I will give this land. That included Jerusalem. Well, that promise had been partially fulfilled under Joshua, but not fully. When Joshua dies, there is still much yet to do. And when King Saul dies, would have been seven years prior to David becoming king, the land that the Israelites actually occupied at that point in time was very limited. It was reduced down from the time of Joshua. And thus, in David becoming king, there is a very serious problem that he has to deal with. He needs a kingdom, right? For the past 300 years, since the time of Joshua, the kingdom's become divided eternally. It's been whittled down externally, and the most powerful, fortified city of the land casts a shadow over everything, and that city is Jerusalem, occupied by a clan of the Canaanites known as Jebusites. There can be no kingdom of David if there is no Jerusalem. And David, who was born and raised in Bethlehem, just five miles outside of Jerusalem, literally grew up in the shadow of this fortified city. Now, I can imagine David, as a very young shepherd boy, having his sheep stolen by the Jebusites, who run off to their fortress and touched. I can see him burning with anger and the sense of injustice. And I can imagine him wondering, why is the city allowed to remain in the land given to God's people? Thus, I believe, when David was anointed by Samuel to be the future king, I think that David, at a very young age, began to plot how he will deal with that city. And I base that belief on what he does after he defeats Goliath. Have you ever noticed, this is from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Jerusalem is still held by the Jebusites. Saul's king. David is a young man. He's probably 18 years old. He's not yet old enough to be in the army. We have that fantastic story of him beating the Philistine giant named Goliath. Well, as you know in the story, he takes that sling and he knocks down that giant with that stone. And as that giant, that Philistine champion, lays in the ground, we don't know if he's dead or not, but he soon becomes dead because David takes his sword and chops off his head. I know we don't hear about that in Sunday school as children, but that's what he does. Do you know what he does with the head of Goliath? This is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 54, I'm reading. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. Why did David bring the head of Goliath to Jerusalem? It's a Jebusite city. And at that, at, you know, at that point in time, he didn't, he, what was he doing? I think David took the head of Goliath to Jerusalem 
as a prophetic promise that a day would come when what has happened to Goliath is going to happen to you. In a sense, he is saying to that mighty fortress on that hill, you think you're Goliath, that you're untouchable, that nothing can be done to you. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. I will strike you down. And thus, the very first thing David does when he is king, he strikes down the real Goliath there in the land, Jerusalem. He captures the city. Our next point. We then read about those who are not allowed into Jerusalem. Verse 8 again. And David said in that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who, hated by, who, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. I'm going to come back to that, so just hold on to that. And then we read a building up of Jerusalem. And David lived in the stronghold called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the Milo inward. And the king is exalted. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. And foreigners now begin to bring riches to Jerusalem. And here am the king of Tyre sent messages to David and cedar trees, also carpenters and masons, and built David a house. And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel, that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And now we read about the king's brides. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. Now, 14 and 15 talk about different names of David's his children. Um, David's his family is a major theme in the book of 2 Samuel. I'm not going to talk about his family today. I'm going to hold off on that. That's a major theme, but today we're not talking about his family. Verse 17, victory over the enemies. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Need to highlight this. Um, we tend to just kind of take, oh, these are just two groups of people kind of fighting together. The Philistines, they were the power of the land. They had superior numbers. They had superior people. They had superior technology, right? They, 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 this is why David hears of them coming. He goes down to the stronghold. And this is why he is very quick to inquire of God. What should I do? Because the Philistines, seven years prior, thumped Israel killed King Saul, the kingdom's divided, it's controlled mostly by the Philistines, and so David has to conquer them. There has to be a victory here, or there is no kingdom, but he is going up, a, up against a superior force. So we read, verse 18, the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Riphaim, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there. And David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Riphaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall, not go, you, shall, you shall not go up, go around to the rear, and come against them opposite the um, balsam trees. Our last theme here, God's army is on the march, reading on. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, I love that. When you hear the sound of God's army on the march, then rouse yourself. For the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. I, I love these themes of 2 Samuel 5. They are so important. And the reason I have highlighted them in this way is that they give a hint. They foreshadow a future kingdom that is coming. And I'm not going to spend time here, but I do want to show, show you it. If you look in your Bible, I'm not going to read this, but if you look at your Bible, to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 19 through Revelation chapter 21, 
when John describes the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven. These are the themes he uses to describe it in. And again, I'm not going to read through that section of scripture, but I do want to just highlight it. Revelation 19.11, you have, John has this vision of the army of God, the, led by Christ coming down at the end of time. And then you have the reign of Jesus Christ. I'm reading verse 16 here. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name rich in king of kings and lord of lords. And then we read his victory over his enemies. And those enemies we read about in Revelation 20 are the enemies of, of Satan and the enemies of death. Then we read about the new Jerusalem that comes down. And in this new Jerusalem, the king himself is exalted, Jesus. And then we even read about the king's bride. Verse 20, chapter 21, verse 9. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And then we have a section in Revelation talking about the walls of this new Jerusalem, of them being built up, and then how foreigners will bring the riches to Jerusalem. And then it ends with a description of those who are not allowed into it. I'll read the last verse of Revelation 21. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor, or, or, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. These themes of 2 Samuel 5, of David entering into Jerusalem, defeating his enemies, are the same themes of Revelation 19 through 21, which means, which means, that when we read 2 Samuel 5, that these things that we are reading, they serve as a type of prophetic promise looking forward to something that is yet to come. Now, in those themes, there's a lot of what we could focus on today. But this morning, I want to focus on one theme. I want to focus on the trash-talking going on between David and the Jebusites. When David comes to Jerusalem to capture it, the Jebusites trash talk him, right? That's what we call it. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land who said to David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Again, this is trash talking. And, 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 and they are basically saying, we are so confident in, the, in our city that you can't touch us, that if we man our walls with people who are blind and lame, you still couldn't even make it into our city. Now, trash talking is something that often happens when people compete. Um, possibly the greatest trash talker in American history was the boxer Muhammad Ali, right? He was great at doing trash talking. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. His hands can't hit what his eyes can't see, right? I, I loved his trash talking I came across. Of he's fighting a fighter by the name of Big Bear Lis Liston. And here's this trash talking of Big Bear Liston. He says, quote, after the fight, I'm going to build myself a pretty home and use him as a bearskin rug. Listed even smells like a beer, and I'm going to give him to the zoo after I whoop him. Right? That's trash talking. The Philistines are trash talking David. They are so secure. Blind and lame, we can, they can defend against you. Well, David captures the city, and he responds back to their trash talking by saying something very similar. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David, and David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack. I think David had scattered that out as a young kid. The lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. David is speaking here about the Jebusites. He's using their trash talking as a way to talk back to them. But something happens. This trash talk about the blind and the lame goes from being only trash talk to a type of prophetic imagery. Because we read on and it says, Therefore it is said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. 
the image of the lame and the blind begin to take on new meaning. Now, I need to pause right here and recognize that talking about the lame and the blind in such a way as I'm talking about them today is in poor taste. It's inappropriate. It's wrong. We are not to talk about people with physical disabilities like this. And I'm fairly certain today that if a professional athlete or any athlete, a high school athlete, was recorded trash-talking an opponent using the exact same terms, they would be in trouble, and rightly so. But let's not miss the prophetic image that's being born right here that we sometimes gloss over because of our modern sensibilities. I call this phrase a prophetic image because, for two reasons, Number one, the blind and the lame are not literally kept out of Jerusalem. If you look in your Bibles just a few chapters ahead to 2 Samuel chapter 9, there is actually a man who is crippled, who is lame in both his feet, who David actually welcomes into the city. He brings him to his table to eat with him. And we we never read anywhere in Scripture of those with physical disabilities kept away. And the second reason I call this phrase regarding the blind and the lame prophetic is because the condition of being blind or being lame takes on a symbolic meaning by the prophets to describe our human condition. And thus it points to a future healing found in that future kingdom of God. Now throughout Scripture we are given a number of words that describe our condition, who we are. Here are some of them. We are sinful. We have fallen short. We are separated from God. We are in debt. We are trespassers. We, we, we are full of iniquity, meaning we're twisted. We stand guilty. We are in to bondage to sin and death. We are unclean or unrighteous. And all of these things point to our need for a Savior. And, and, in, des- and, and, and in describing our iniquity or separation from God, the prophets would also often use visible conditions as a way to describe spiritual conditions. We struggle with this. We, we hear things like, you stand guilty before God. It's like, okay, right, okay, that's some legal thing up there in heaven. Why, why, why does it bother me now? Why, why should it concern me now? And I'm sure our struggle to understand what that means is the same as people back in the time of the prophets. And so they would use imagery, physical imagery, to describe what that iniquity looks like, what that sin looks like, what that guilt looks like. And much of the imagery is using the language that we see here today. Physical imagery. Some examples here. The condition of leprosy or being unclean is an imagery being used for unrighteousness. Isaiah 64, 6. We've all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We, will, we, we all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Or the condition of being blind or deaf. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. And, and, and he goes on to describe he's about the blind and the deaf. He sees many things, but he does not observe them. He hears, his ears are open, but he does not hear. Or the condition of being physically weak or disabled. Psalm 82. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And he goes on to describe the weak and the needy. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. Again, to be clear, Scripture is using various physical disabilities as a way to describe the condition of people's souls. But, but, people who have these physical disabilities are never seen, nor are they ever judged as being more sinful or less than those who do not. Jesus makes this really clear. Upon seeing a man who was born blind, the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, that man or his parents, 
Jesus responds, neither, neither. That's not why he is blind. He says, rather, for the works of God might be displayed in him. In Luke chapter 13, people come to Jesus and say to Jesus, and they begin to tell him all the horrific sufferings that different people are having, and it's clear they're telling him in such a way they must be suffering because of the sin in their life. And Jesus responds back to them saying, no, you don't understand. I'm reading from Luke chapter 13, verse, verse 4. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In other words, do not consider those who are suffering a disability, a sickness, or some horrific event to be worse sinners than you, but rather look at what they are suffering as a visible image of what happens to you if you don't repent a visible image of a soul stuck in sin. The human condition is such that we are deaf to the word of God. We are blind to his presence. We are weak to follow his will to do that which God desires. And thus the prophetic words of David stand true. The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Probably the most shocking encounter I ever had with a person who was crippled took place in Bangladesh. Our office secretary, Janet Doss, was to be married, and so we traveled to her village where she was from and there met her family. Years prior, her father had suffered an accident causing him to be paralyzed from neck down, and in, in that country, it's hard to imagine how horrible that would be to then live paralyzed from the neck down. He lived his days laying on a bed, his head propped up so you could kind of look around. He had some movement of a hand, and in his hand he would hold a mirror, and he would simply just use that mirror to look at things around in the room. That's what he did. That's what his life was like. That's all that he could do. He couldn't feed himself. He couldn't clean himself. He could not walk his bride down the aisle. He could not enjoy the flowers of the spring. The entirety of his life consisted of lying on a bed using a mirror to watch others. That's what Scripture is saying about our condition. We are weak. We are paralyzed to do that which is truly good and right. And being paralyzed spiritually is a bondage. It's a captivity that we can't save ourselves from. It's a bondage to death, a falling short of what glorifies God. And outside of Christ, we are paralyzed from a life that is full and abundant. The human condition is not just that we stand guilty before God, but that we are also blind and lame unable to enter his house. And the evidence of this, the evidence of this going on in your soul, we see blindness when, when we fail to trust him in our struggles. There's blindness when we fail to see him at work, when we doubt him as our Savior. There's blindness in us when we do not see God at work in the lives of other people. When we don't view other people through the lens of love, but instead judge and criticize and put down, that's blindness at work. These are the things that give evidence to how we are blind. And likewise, the evidence of being spiritually disabled is that sloth that plagues us from doing what we know we are ought to do. The inadequacy, the winds, of, of feelings and thoughts of being inadequate, of being a self-disappointment, of depression when those winds blow across one's soul. That's that spiritual crippledness. We are in need of a Savior, not just, again, to remove the stain, but to open our eyes, to give strength to our knees so that we may leap for joy. I love this about the prophet's um, and I'm just going to quote only one scripture here. 
but throughout Scripture, when the prophets begin to describe the coming of that future king, they use the words, the language of healing that which is blind, of healing that which is weak, to describe what the Savior will do. One example, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 talking about the coming Messiah. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the, the ears of the deaf and stopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. He's talking about us, those who through faith have become followers of our Savior. Thus, in our Gospels, when John the baptizer sends some disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you really the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you Christ, the living one of God? Jesus responds by saying to them, go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus' words are more than just describing the physical miracles and healing he's performing. He does indeed heal the blind and heal the lame and cleanse lepers. But John knew, John the baptizer knew who preached the repentance of sins. He knew the real issue was people's hearts. And so Jesus, in speaking the fulfillment of these prophetic words, is reminding John that indeed he is the one because it's in him that people are healed. And this healing is for you. Are your eyes opened? Is your body whole? If you're not, if your eyes are closed, if you struggle with blindness, if you are crippled, what are you to do? Well, Scripture gives us only one thing to do, it's to cry out to Jesus, right? I love the imagery throughout the Gospels of every person who is in need. They cried out to Jesus, and Jesus stopped and healed them. So I think that's my application today. Cry out to Jesus. On this day of Pentecost, let's close this time in prayer and cry out to him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I, I'm grateful that you have indeed through your Son, through the outpouring of your Spirit, brought healing into our lives, that you have opened our eyes and helped us to see you and glimpse you, that you have unstopped our ears to hear not just of you, but to hear you, and you have strengthened our frame, strengthened our souls, so that we may better draw near to you. Lord, I know that there are times in our lives that we grow cold, that we grow prideful, that we, we cease to trust and depend upon you, and we begin that drift away. So, Father, once again, we cry out to you, have mercy on us. Bring healing to our eyes, bring healing to our souls, uh, those things that are weak within us. Bring healing to um, your hand upon us, Father. We thank you for this morning, Lord, and may we, um, throughout this week and these days ahead, may we today cry out to you, seek you for the healing that we desperately need, and we give you thanks for the healing that you give. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to close now. This is a hymn of invitation. Um, it's invitation for those who would like to, to simply be prayed with. We welcome you to come forward. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to have deacons and our pastors to pray with you. If you would like to join us as a church, I invite you to come forward at this time to make that known, and we'd love to welcome you. But most importantly, if you are someone who is blind, who is crippled, I'm not speaking physically, I'm speaking spiritually, and you know it. And you need the Lord's healing hand upon you to open you up to his spirit. I invite you to come forward um, now or after the service. Let us begin this journey of following the Lord, of, of being transformed according to who he is. Um, so I invite you to do that as we sing this final hymn. I am making a special request to Mr. Roy Maynard. Would you please come forward 
at this time too so that we can pray for you as we close out today. Karen, so please stand. <laughs> Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft. Peter and Peter and Leslie, please join me right here. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Peter Starnes. This is my wife, Leslie. And we have two kids, Le uh, Louisa and Lena Starnes. They're in the back. Um, but we wish to join you guys as a church members. Amen. Amen. So please, <laughs> please, um, please welcome them after the service. I'm going to, I'm going to roll Roy right here so you can. Turn me, turn me around here. <laughs> this is great. I hate believing. said you've been so good to me and he also said thank you very much but Roy that's what we want to say to you you've been so good to us and thank you for all the things you've done all of the adults here luncheons that you have organized and 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 and, and provided the Sunday school teaching that you have done over the years the ways that you have cared for our church finances and the um, trips that you have organized and planned Lee said, um, Roy's going on a trip. And you know what? You can go too, but it's going to cost a lot of money. So <laughs> this is a very expensive trip. He's going there to stay. But um, he, he, yeah. he, he obviously is somebody that we dearly love, who has dearly loved this church. And we want to pray for him and pray for his family as we close out today. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I lift up Roy to you. I'm grateful for him. I'm grateful for your faithfulness to him. I'm grateful for his family that loves him, that is here today, that's surrounding him, Father. I pray that as he moves, that he does so um, supported and encouraged by you, that you give to him everything that he needs in this move, Father. And 
Lord, that you continue to use him in remarkable ways. We are thankful for Roy. We also are thankful for Peter and Leslie. We lift them up to you and um, ask your hand upon them and, and their family. And Father, I do pray that your spirit does indeed work in our lives, opening our eyes and opening our ears and strengthening our souls towards you, Father, so we may more able to do what you've called us to do and be. In Christ's name, amen. Blessings, right? Amen.